morning again. That was pretty quiet. Good morning again. Yeah, that's better. Um, I uh, had an interesting lesson this week. I, um, I've done this before. I go to the gym a little bit. I like to run, but I got a personal trainer, and uh, they're really, I think they're demonic, actually. <laughs> they're, they're just evil. You know, they're like, lift this, put this down, you know, and then when you're really, really tired, um, yeah, the guy says to me, I need you to do a roundhouse kick on this bag. Well, I studied martial arts for many years. I'm like, I've only known this guy five minutes, so he doesn't know. While he's explaining how to do a roundhouse kick, I just did a great one, like a perfect one, like the best one that's ever been done, in fact. And he's like, oh, well, you already know how to do that. And so I said, yeah, I do. So he said, we'll do like 400 of them. So anyway, at a later point, or an earlier point, I don't want to, anyway, uh, I'm carrying something really heavy, and I trip, and I fall down, and I bang my head. And that's proof that pride comes before a fall. If you guys don't know the King James Version, this actually happened. So I have this little scar on my head today. But thanks to Susan, who covered it up a little bit, it looks a little better. Um, we, uh, we've been doing this series, and I kind of want to, like, you know, finish it up, wind it up today with, a, you know, hopefully a good exclamation mark on the end. Uh, but I need to start by this. Uh, we're, we're meeting here today for a reason. And the reason is that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe that Jesus came in the womb of a virgin, and that he was born, and that he lived out this perfect life, and as the Lamb of God, he was crucified for sins of men and women, boys and girls, yes? And so when we get together, it's not just because it's Sunday morning. There's a reason for it. And then, of course, Jesus told us lots of things, but uh, boiling a lot of it down, what he's basically saying is you need to love God and you need to love each other. And to the disciples, he said, what I want you to do is this. It's better that I leave. I know you don't get it right now, but you will. It's better that I leave because when I leave, I can send the paraclete. That's the Greek word for what we boil out is basically the Holy Spirit. And he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And then he, he ascends. And the disciples are standing there. A couple of them are watching, looking up. And an angel comes and says, why are you looking up? Didn't he already tell you what to do? Go and get busy. <laughs> But not until the Holy Spirit comes. So go and wait. And so they waited in the upper room. And of course, the Holy Spirit comes and he baptizes them with fire. And literally everything changed from that moment forward. Everything. I mean, the world cannot deny the fact that Jesus came and that he lived this life. They can say he was perfect or he wasn't. They can believe it or they cannot. But the world has changed. Amen? Amen. And for the better, amen. Uh, so anyway, Peter, Peter walks right out, you know, and preaches, and 3,000 people fall on their face and say, we crucified the Son of God, what are we going to do? And he says, believe and be baptized, every one of you. And so that process started the church. And like I said, you know, it changed the world forever. But even, even now, Jesus calls us, his church, the bride, or his bride, the bride of Christ. And he still loves us, amen? amen. And so today, even today, this is not necessarily an evangelical sermon, but I'm telling you that even today, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and you confess with your mouth that you are a sinner, and you need salvation, then Jesus offers that salvation today to every one of us. And you too, just like I have, be, can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, it happened to me about 30 years ago. Uh, there's been some ups and some downs, but eventually I was ordained about 20 years ago. And believe it or not, we just had a birthday in the church. I didn't celebrate or anything because it's just 11, but we just turned 11. Um, we've been in, this is, I think, our fourth location. Uh, but now we're here, and we have some land, and we have a building. So when I say we're a young church, what I typically mean is we haven't been here very long. Um, but we have gotten up to, you know, maybe 75, 80, 100 people, a couple different places. And then kind of when we move, it kind of goes down. But here we are, uh, and we are the bride of Christ, even though it's this little room. And by the way, I don't know if you know this or not, there are big churches, lots around you know, around here even. But the average church is really only 57, 65 people. Uh, that's the average church. So really, it's not even that, that badly. Anyway, the believers formed this community, and this is how it went. Acts 2.42. It'll come up on the screen. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to sharing in the meals, and that, of course, includes the Lord's Supper and to prayer. And so what they did is they got a community together, and they said, we're going to do four things. We're going to study the Word of God, if you will. That was the apostles' teaching. We're going to basically care for one another, fellowship, share with one another. We're going to eat together, and we're going to pray together. And they took off, and those four things changed the world. 
They did. They changed the world. I know lots of churches have lots of other things going on now, but if you could just do those four things, I think you can change the world. Um, reading on, this happened afterward. Acts 2, 43 through 47. It says, A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. And all the while, they were praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? I know if you read a couple more pages, they started feeding them to the lions, right? And a lot of horrible things happened. But the reality is that they still stood strong in their faith. Not maybe all of them. There's a couple problems here and there. But for the most part, they all stood in their faith. And the disciples, the apostles, what we call them, every single one of them was put to the sword except for John. And we know now why that was, because God allowed him to stay and write us five letters, if you will. And, of course, the last one would be the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so even that was prophetic and changed the world. But here's the problem. I am a pastor in the year 2019, and I look around the world, and I look around the church, and I'm, I'm a thinker. You probably wouldn't think that because I'm always just goofing around, but I am a thinker. And when I look at the church, I see little difference today between the lifestyles of the average Christian and the world. Uh, there's famous people like George Barna who do these surveys, and Lifeway, Christian, lots of other places, uh, Tom Rainer does a lot of them, Dr. Rainer. They do a lot of surveys. They go out and they look, and, the, and they're saying exactly what I'm saying, or I'm saying what they're saying. There is little difference between the church of Jesus Christ and the world around it. Am I right? Well, so what's the deeper? And here's, here's what i got to say. So this deep sense of awe that was in the early church and the Acts 2 church, where is that deep sense of awe now? So I know some have it. But when we get together for church, often I don't think there's a deep sense of awe. Um, where are the miracles? And I'm not saying that God is not powerful. I'm saying the opposite. He is all powerful. But I'm saying where are the actual miracles like the ones they saw then? Because it's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same God. It's the same church. We're, nothing changed except that we have become, if you will, not what we were supposed to be. And so I think there's often miracles here and there, but they're just not the ones I think they should be. And I think often there's not as much power in our prayer as there should be because we don't have the faith that we should have. If I'm making this up, then just write me a letter and leave the church. I don't know what else to say. But I'm just saying that I believe that most Christians I know, and I am one, have a powerless faith. Does that mean completely powerless? No. But if we actually were the people God calls us to be, then we maybe would actually be able to have a sense of awe and pray and things would change. Do you believe that's true? And so the reason why I put this little series together is because I've just looked out and I said the world has kind of infiltrated the church and I'm calling it worldly, if you will. Worldly. I got a slide. It says it. Prognosis worldly. Um, <clears throat> sadly, sadly today, and, I, and I'm going to talk about this today, the areas where the, the church and the world seem to kind of be in agreement, and I mean in agreement not necessarily in what we say we believe, but in actually what we do, is in the area of, of family and marriage. Family and marriage. George Barna actually did, uh, he's a, probably the, the most popular Christian uh, exo, well, whatever I want to say. Anyway, he goes out and he surveys everybody. He's a scientist. But he actually showed in a couple of surveys not so long ago that Christians divorce in a higher rate than the world around them. Like, this has got to be insane. It's like 58% to 56%. I'm like, this just cannot be true, but it's true. And so once again, in the areas where it seems like it would be most important, the church and the world seem to be in agreement in what they do. Um, here's a fact. One of the fastest growing areas of divorce in the United States today is actually not among young people. Among young people, it's going down. But also, a lot of them don't marry. So <laughs> there's maybe something in there. But it's actually in the area of, the, of kind of like the baby boomers where I'm at. The people that are in the church should actually be 
knowing better and doing better are winding up on the rocks in their marriages and they're divorcing at, like I said, even a higher rate than the world around them. I've uh, been reading about this for a few weeks. I actually got a quote from uh, Forbes today. It'll come up on the screen. Um, it's called Gray Divorce, Its Reasons and Implications. Let me read this a little bit for you. <clears throat> Gray divorce refers to a de demographic trend that has witnessed an increase in the split or separation of older couples who have been married for a long time. Gray divorce are, are, is also called silver or diamond splitters, and the term refers to the hair color, obviously, of older people. The term began to be used in the United States in 2004, but the practice had already been prevalent for about 20 years. Research shows that the overall rate of divorce in the United States has declined over the past 20 years, but the divorce rate above people over 50 is on the rise. Now, when I have a room with the people in them, I, I, and you know, you know, some of you are older and some of you are younger, but I know that there's people in the room that have been divorced. So I'm not casting dispersions on anyone who's suffered it or, or you know, had, had to go through it. I'm just saying this is where we're at and taking the lens and saying this is really not how it's supposed to be. It's just not. Um, I got a couple slides I want to share with you guys today. This is actually, um, <clears throat> this has the divorce rate. Well, can you go back? I think I have one before that. Uh, Lindsay might not have put it. Go back, go back, go back, go back. Go back. Uh, well, one more. No, it doesn't. It's not in there. Anyway, I have, a, I have a, a slide here that says in 25 years that the divorce rate went from 21% to blah, blah. Today, it is at, in 25 years, among this age bracket, baby boomers, it's up 109%. 109%. I'll put this slide on the, on the uh, church website later so you can see it. And then I was digging around some Pew Research, some more of these analytics, and uh, I got a couple of those. You bring these up for me. So... There you go. So here, I know it's hard to read this slide, but what it basically says is among Christians that have been uh, around divorced or separated, it's like 74%. And then you break that down, it says evangelical Protestant Christians, like 28% of the people who are getting divorced. I'm an evangelical Protestant Christian. <laughs> okay, most of us are, right? You mean about 30% of the people who are getting divorced in the church is us? How is that even possible? And then you look around, it's like Muslims only divorce at 1%. Well, we, we, have to, we, we know Jesus. We know the Son of God. Jewish, 1%, okay? Other world religions, less than 1%. And here we are at 30%. Well, let's move on to this Pew Research. This is it. Belief in God among divorced or separated adults. Belief in God, 69%. So it says right here, believe in God is absolutely certain, 69%. 18% believe in God, and they're fairly certain. So if you put those together, it's basically everybody. And they're saying, we believe in God, we're absolutely certain of it, and these are divorced and separated couples. Um, importance of religion in one's life among separated or divorced adults. So this says that God is very important, 57%. God is somewhat important. 24%. That's basically all of them. And so they're saying that God is super important in our lives. And yet we are married, we're divorced, or we're separated. Attendance at religious services among divorced or separated adults. Ah, this one is the one that starts to hurt. 32% uh, only go to church. 32% go to church at least one week a month. And then if you say once, when they go well, a couple of times a year, it's 35%. They're not going to church really at all. And so you're like, oh, well, maybe there's a reason why this is going on. Uh, frequency of reading scripture among divorced or separated adults, at least once a week, 39%. Once or twice a month, 11%. So they're not going to church, and for the most part, they're not in the Bible. Once a week, you read the Bible and read a couple of verses once a week, that's not in the scriptures. Uh, interpreting scripture among divorced or separated adults. This is interesting. A word of God should be taken literally, 36%. Word of God should be taken mostly literally, 25%. And so I think you see what I'm saying here. You've got people who believe in God. You've got people who believe in the scriptures. You've got people, I actually didn't put this up because it would just go on forever, who believe in prayer and yet don't really go to church if they don't go to church, I guarantee you they're not serving in the church, and they're not really reading the Word of God. So is it going to go well? 
Is the prognosis good? Absolutely not. How could it be? But we're God's people, right? We're God's people. We're his bride. God invented marriage. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying it doesn't make any sense where we're going in the church. Sadly, what we say that we believe and what we do are not the same here. They're not. And that makes us hypocrites. I know no one likes that word, but if you say one thing and you do another thing, that is hypocritical. And so I know we're all hypocrites, hypocrites here and there because everything we say can't match everything we do. But we're the church of Jesus Christ, and we're saying we're the champions of marriage. We're the champions of family, and yet we're really not. Uh, <clears throat> typical conservative Protestant beliefs. I want to read you a few. This is like the doctrine of our church and basically any Protestant church. I'm just going to read you a couple. We teach that marriage was given by God as a part of his common grace and that it has no meaning other than that he has provided it. I think I have a slide that says that. Keep going. There we go. And the next one. We teach that marriage is subject to the curse and the fall of man, but that believers living in obedience to the scriptures and under the control of the Holy Spirit can begin to experience peaceful, productive, and fulfilled marriage as intended by God. That's Genesis 3.16 and 1 Peter 3.7. And so we believe that even though we live in a sinful world, that God still created marriage, put it together. It's his reasoning. It's his plan. And that if we do it his way, we can experience some of what has is like. And if we don't, we can experience a lot of what hell is like. Amen? Um, we teach that believers' marriages are to illustrate Christ's relationship with his church and that believers should choose to marry those who share the faith and thereby generate life. I'm not sure it's all typed out right, but that's what it says. We teach that the term marriage has only one meaning, and that it is marriage sanctioned by God, which joins one man and one woman in a single exclusive reunion, as delineated in the scriptures, Genesis 2, 23 and 24. And just one more. We teach that God hates divorce, permitting it only where there has been an unrepentant sexual sin, Malachi 2, 14 to 16, Matthew 5, 32, or desertion by an unbeliever. That would be 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 15. And we teach that remarriage is permitted to a faithful partner, but only when the divorce was on biblical grounds. I know that that's super narrow. If you think that's narrow, read the Catholic doctrine, okay? There's a lot more room in, uh, in a Protestant doctrine for the realities that actually come hit us all. Um, but even in Jesus' day, this is not surprising. This stuff was going on. Uh, marriages were, were under distress and duress. And uh, one day, some ultra-religious people came and they tried to trick Jesus. See, the Jews are just like everybody else. In that sense, they're people. And, you know, they saw these nations around them, and they were getting rid of their wives and getting younger wives. And mostly it was the guys back then. It wasn't the women. They didn't have that kind of power. Um, but that's what they were doing. They're like, oh, well, that, that young cutie over there in the other land, you know, we, I want to do that. And so they would just write a little piece of paper and hand it to him, and it's a writ of divorce, get out. And so then the woman has no way to provide for herself. And it's really bad. And when you read stuff that doesn't make any sense, like uh, Solomon had a thousand concubines, well, a lot of those were just women that were out and they had no husbands, and he could bring them into his palace and say, you can live here. That's a concubine. And it might have been more involved in that. I don't really know. But that's what you hear a lot of that kind of stuff going on. They didn't have any power. So it was the men. And specifically, even the priests were doing it. And God got really mad at them. Anyway, one day, these religious people come. And they said, we're going to trick Jesus. We're going to fool him. And we're going to make him basically say what we want to do. And so here it is just in Mark 10. Uh, 1 through 9. Then Jesus left Capernaum and went down to the region of Judea and into the area east of the Jordan River. Once again, the crowds gathered around him, and as usual, he was teaching them. Uh, some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? And Jesus answered them with this question. <laughs> what did Moses say in the law about divorce? Well, he permitted it, they replied, he, uh, he said, a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. And Jesus said, he wrote this commandment only as a concession to your hard hearts. 
But God made them male and female, that's a quote, from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one put apart or split apart what God has joined together. When we do weddings, we always say it, right? What God has made one, let no man put asunder. That's the kind of the way the Greek is translated out. And so this was a recurring problem for them. And they tried to say, you know, well, whoa, we, got, we got Moses. And he's like, listen, the only reason Moses conceded is because you guys are wearing him out. Well, I don't like her anymore. I don't like her anymore. And so he's like, all right, fine. Then, you know, write her a writ of divorce and get her out because it seems like it's more violent the way it is. And I'm not Moses, and I don't know why I did it, but Jesus, Jesus just explained it. it was because their hearts were hard. Well, once again, it's a recurring problem because in the last book of the Old Testament, we see it again. In the last book of the Old Testament, we read this, Malachi 2, 15 to 16. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. And so guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. If you read on, it says that he sees it as a violence toward the other partner. So if you come in and you say, I want a divorce, he says, that is violent. I see that as violent, and that's the reason why I hate it. And also, because I made you one, you can't really be ever two again, and I wanted godly children. And so while you're doing this, you're hurting your family, and you're hurting my family. And so that's where we're at. Um, that Forbes article I read earlier lists five reasons for divorce. And I, I think some of them are kind of interesting, so I thought I'd read them for you. Um, number one reason, poor financial management. Uh, so fighting about money. Basically, you know, you get yourself in debt, and then you fight about it, and you can't do the things you want to do, and so that's one of the reasons Forbes always writes about money anyway, so they would see that. Number two, growing apart. They both had different careers, they both had different lives, you know, and they just grew apart, and they just didn't have anything together anymore, although God had made them one. Uh, three, infidelity. Somebody's cheating. Um, Better health and life expectancy rates. So basically, Forbes is saying, well, you probably wouldn't have got divorced except you lived longer than 40, so now you're tired of each other, and so you get a divorce. I could see that happening. <clears throat> and five, it says addictions. Addictions. And, you know, that could probably be from television uh, to heroin. I mean, somewhere, anywhere in there. Just addictions that take you away from where you really should be with your spouse. Um, but I'll tell you what, I have another thesis, and uh, it really doesn't go along with Forbes, but I think that, that I, I, I've been saying this for many years, and my thesis is this, that the church actually isn't teaching the right stuff. And by the church, I mean not me, because my job, actually, if you know the job of a pastor from the scripture, is to train and equip the saints for the works of service. My job is to train you to do the works of service. And so when, you, when I say the church is not promoting right teaching, it's not teaching the right thing, I'm saying it's you who aren't doing it. Because it's not really my job. When you, Alita, are with your girlfriends, right, are you teaching and promoting right things? Guys, when you're out with the boys, right, are you teaching and promoting right things? Or... Do you do what most of us do and say, well, you know, just kind of compartmentalize that to Sunday with my other people? What's worse, what's worse is when we get together in our Bible studies and we get together in our small groups, whatever they may be, from hunting to golfing to an actual Bible study, when we actually break down the things that are happening in our lives, are we teaching the right things? Or are we teaching kind of what the world is saying? Well, you know, he has been annoying for a really long time. Maybe I'll get rid of him. I'm telling you, I've heard it. I've heard it with my own ears. And then as a pastor, I'm like, whoa, stop. That's not right. Um, and why I'm saying is because we're doing that, that is worldly. It's a problem, and it shouldn't be that way. But you know, it's happened before. It's always happened before. And Paul exhorted Titus to basically say, he says, teach the old men to teach this. Teach the young men to act like this. Teach the old women to teach this. Teach the young women to act like this. Teach them this. I just want to read you just a teeny little piece out of Titus 2. 
As for you, Titus, Paul says, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect, and to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach, uh, teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and to be pure, to, to work in their homes. Doesn't mean you can't work outside your home. To do good and to be submissive to their husbands. Oh my God, did you say submissive? And then they will not bring shame on the word of God. You see, we pull apart even just from words, like little ones like that. We're like, no, no, we're not going there. Well, are we in a better place? No, we're not. And so what I'm telling you is that the things that we should be teaching are not the things we are teaching. And the things we're living are not the things we're supposed to be living. But just like in Jesus' day, the very group that should be teaching and setting the example are the ones that are often leading the charge. It was the old men who were religious and had risen up way to the very top who were saying, Jesus, are you sure we can't get a divorce? I mean, did you really say? That's what was going on. Just what Satan always says. Did God really say? Did God really say? Yeah, he said it. Now do it. Live a different way. And so I'm going to... I'm going to wrap this up. I mean, I have four more pages here, but I'm going to wrap it up by saying something that I've said so many times from Bible studies to this pulpit. God loves you, and he loves marriage, and he invented it, but Satan hates it. Satan hates it. He hates marriage. He hates family. He hates godly children. He hates virginity. I mean, he hates anything that's pure and holy and righteous and true. He hates the word of God. And so what I'm trying to say is because he hates it, he's put marriage and family under attack from every single angle he can think of. And he's been doing it for a long time, but it's really gaining steam. Am I right? It's not only gaining steam, but there are pastors in this community right here who are either gay or lesbian, and they're in the pulpit right now while I am. While the Word of God specifically says it's not allowed. There's all kinds of examples like that, and I know you can come up with them if you want. And I'm not trying to hate people. I'm saying that is where we have gone. And it's under attack. And so the older Christian men who should be champions of marriage are on dating sites and looking for upgrades. Um, they remind me of the people that Malachi was preaching against. God hates divorce. What are you doing? God hates that. It's a violent thing. Why are you doing that? But that's what's happening. And the older Christian women who should be teaching the younger Christian women, they're doing the same thing. Oh, you know what? He's, he's pro you could have done better. Maybe you should upgrade. Listen, there is no upgrade when you talk about a man. We're all pretty much the same. <laughs> you know it's true. I know I've always wanted to use this verse in church. I've never been able to do it, but I worked it in today. So here it comes. Amos, prophet Amos, said a lot of things that God told him to say. And one day he said this about the older women who should have been teaching it's, I'm doing it. Not you, not you, anybody. He says this, Amos 4.1, Israel has not returned to God. This is the, the subtitle. Hear this words, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria. You women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. Okay, forget the cow part, right? I don't know why God said that, but he created cows, and, you know, let's just say this. I said that in Titus, they were told to be not slanderers. You know, they were supposed to do this. They weren't supposed to be drunks. And so here you have the older women who were in Israel, and he's saying, look at you. You're just suppressing people. You're crushing people. You could, you're risen up to the point where you have some power and authority, and all you're doing is you're saying, send us some drinks. Um, from the Pew Research Statistics, from the other things I've read, I've read uh, some parts of four books on gray divorce. 
I can tell you that I think it's safe to say that we as a church have wandered away from the professed faith. And in this area, family and marriage, not all of us, but a lot of us has become worldly. And God does not like it. In fact, he hates it. Um, when I was called to, to be a pastor, I knew it would be difficult. I, uh, I absolutely positively knew it would be difficult, but I really had no idea. I just had seen things and, you know, had, uh, I hadn't been around the church a lot, but I'd seen just the weight of, uh, of people's pain on the pastor's heart. I'd seen that. But I got to tell you that, you know, I just, I don't think I had a speck of knowledge about it. Um, but Paul said as much, and when I got into the scriptures, I read stuff like this, 1 Corinthians 4, 9. For it seems to me, Paul says, that God has made us apostles or put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. And so what Paul is saying is, you know, Paul is, is God's champion. He wrote about a third of the New Testament, but he's saying... You know, when a king goes and takes over a nation, they, you know, they drag all the plunder back, they drag all the gold and all the cool stuff, and they take the horses and they take the, you know, chariots and whatever else. At the very, very end of this procession, they have these chained slaves. They're all naked and just walking, being drugged along. And Paul says, it seems to me like even though I love the Lord and he's put me in ministry, he's got me at the very end of the procession like a slave, being drugged in front of everybody. I'm telling you, I thought that was just craziness until I started being a pastor for a while and started to see what really happens. So you're a Christian. Oh, so you're a pastor. It's unbelievable the things that people will say. Um, the truth is I really didn't have any idea, and, and I also did not have the idea of the attacks on my family. I, I had no idea. And I'm going I'm to be careful here because I have to be very careful about it. Um, God has seen us through multiple, very, very difficult things. I mean, really super difficult things. Like, I just don't want to get into it. But stuff where people just didn't think we would be able to stay in ministry after going through it. Paul says this to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted, or everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Every single one of us. It's a fact. Um, I'll give you a quick personal testimony, and, uh, and then I'm going to ask uh, Aaron to pray. Um, I was married to my wife on 27 June 1992. I got a picture. I was a little younger, about 30 years, I think it is. I don't have a picture of this. Don't, I don't have a picture of the family either? Okay. Um, well, that's because the person who makes the slides um, is not here today. So anyway, um, that's about 27 years of marriage. We have seven children. They are beautiful. And uh, we have 10 grandchildren. And it's, you know, just, you know, most people would say, wow, that's, that's the life. We've spent a long time in ministry. Some of it has been very difficult. Uh, years of, you know, working in teen centers. For those who have known me for longer, you, some of you were there. You know, the 2 or 3 a.m., you know, coming home was pretty rough. But uh, we did it, and we made it through it. Um, we started a church from scratch uh, from our home Bible study. Some of you were involved in that, a couple's Bible study. And uh, I can tell you that we did date nights every Thursday for about 25 years. Uh, we did devotionals at home. We did personal Bible studies. We did uh, devotionals for our children. And then one day, about 18 months ago, something snapped. It just snapped. I would say snapped because I never saw it coming. Not once, not ever did I ever see it coming, but something snapped. And my wife, God loves her, but she has not been to this church in more than a year, and she's probably, probably longer than that. Um, she's not interested in it. We've been going to counseling on and off for several years. Great, great Christian counseling. And we've gone through multiple Bible studies about it. Um, in the last 18 months, we've gone through two intensive marriage rescues. One of them was focused on the family in Colorado. 
uh, well, from Colorado, they did it in Branson. Another one was lo more local, but let me just tell you, they take you apart and they look at everything and they try to tell you what you need to do. Um, after the last one, um, we've been separated for 15 months. I know I try to keep it a secret. <laughs> I mean, I know you can see, but I try to keep it a secret because I was hoping that we could fix it. You know, I was hoping that we could, you know, there'd be a miracle. Lots of you guys have been praying, but as of uh, maybe about a, six weeks ago, uh, my wife said there is literally nothing that you could do to save this marriage. It's over. And so without a miracle from God, I believe that is the case. And so it's left me in kind of a cloud of, of uh, uh, disillusionment. Um, the elders would know this, and some of you as well, close friends, would know that I'm uh, in disbelief. I've done all that Kubler-Ross stuff where you, you know, get angry and then you, you know, all that dealing with the death thing. And uh, I've acted out. Um, I've, you know, a good friend of mine said, your, your pain is bleeding into your sermons. And all that's true. Uh, and so here's these things that I absolutely know. Um, one, I know that God loves me. I know he called me, and I know he put me in ministry. That's a fact. I also know that he loves Jill. I know Jesus loves Jill uh, with all of his heart. He loves our children uh, and our grandchildren. And he loves you, and he loves this church. But the reality is, at this very moment, I think I'm hurting the church. And so what I'm asking to do and what I've asked the elders if I could do is I'm going to take a sabbatical. It has no sundown on it. I don't know how long it will be. Uh, and I'll continue to, uh, to work in the church and do the things that I think I need to do as the executive pastor. Uh, but starting uh, in about five minutes, I will not be preaching anytime soon. But about me, I can tell you this. Paul said to Timothy, but as for you... 2 Timothy 3.14, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of because you know these things are from whom you learn them. Um, and I do know that Jesus is the Son of God and everything I told you, I still believe. What I also know is Satan is a son of a bitch. And he will put your marriage in a target and he will try to destroy it. And if you get into ministry, I think it probably just cranks it up a little bit, but everybody is uh, suspect, subject to it, that's a fact. I, I would like you to do this. I would like you to rally around Aaron, uh, who will take on most of the preaching duties. He's my oldest son. I would like you to pray even more for his wife and his family, and maybe possibly even mine and our children. And I'll leave this last with you. Uh, if you do not know that Jesus is the Son of God, in spite of what you're hearing from me today, believe it. Because there's no other explanation for why a man like Jesus would come and then die on a cross and not even speak a word in his own defense if it wasn't to come and to die for stuff like this. So Aaron, if you don't mind, I'm sorry, I know I'm just calling you out. What would you pray? God bless it. I'm older, I'm older than I look. <laughs>
And uh, I love him very much. I love my brothers and sisters. I love Jill. And um, I think he's right in saying how important it is for us to teach the generations under us what's important and, and, um, and learn from this in our, in our own families what we can. Before I just continue to ramble, you know, um, I don't want my family to dissolve. I love my wife so much. I love my kids. I don't ever want to be stuck in that position. So if it's this church or my marriage, I'm, I'm bolted. Don't ever make me, make me choose because I'm going to choose her every time because that's what God calls me to do. That being said, I'll fight for every one of you in prayer or I'll just be a pain in the neck. <laughs> um, I like to fight in, in a godly way. Let, let's um, let's just let's pray together. Let's pray, let's pray together. Lord what a, just a tough day. Tough message for my dad that in a tough road that he's been on lately, Lord, and uh, just being dragged here and there. Lord, I pray that as a church we'll rally, continue the rule of rally around him and pray for him. Lord, I pray that um, even in the midst of this, we can be hopeful, just never give up. I always believe there's room for redemption in all things. Teach us to do things your way. Lord, I uh, thank you for just the peace that we can get in tough stuff, even if it just seems momentary. I don't know what it'd be like anymore without hope. And I pray as a church we take this tough stuff and it just compels us to love everyone, even ourselves. I pray and ask just to bless us as a church, the individuals, Lord, I pray that you motivate, motivate us through, through and with your grace today to become more like your son. Lord, I pray that we have eyes for him only because of his bride. Soon to be bride. <laughs> Lord, I pray that all in Jesus.